Welcome to the Bladed Tech Channel's 44th edition of the Space and Tech History Rewind. We were reviewing the milestones that occurred on each day in the week of April 12th through April 18th in space exploration, science, and technology. April 12, 1961, the Vostok 1 was lifted to orbit on a modified R-7 ICBM rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome's Launch Complex 1 on this date. It was the first manned spaceflight ever and featured one orbit of the Earth. The Soviet Union prepared three press releases, one for success and two for failures. It was only known 10 minutes after burnout, 25 minutes after launch, if a stable orbit had been achieved. Yuri Gagarin was the cosmonaut. The payload included life support equipment and radio and television to relay information on the condition of the pilot. The flight was automated. Gagarin's controls were locked to prevent him from taking control of the ship, except in an emergency. After one orbit, the service module separated from the craft, leaving Gagarin in the re-entry sphere and heat shield assembly. He then ejected after re-entry and descended under his own parachute, as was planned. Interestingly, this was denied for many years by the Soviet Union, because the flight would not have been recognized for various world records unless the pilot had accompanied his craft to a landing. Perhaps being first in space is accomplishment enough. April 13, 1953, the Discover 2 spy satellite was lifted to orbit on a Thor Agena A rocket from the Vandenberg Air Force Base's Launch Complex 1W on this date. The satellite became the first to be maneuvered on command from Earth, to separate a re-entry vehicle on command, and to send its re-entry vehicle back to Earth. However, the film capsule ejector system malfunctioned, causing the capsule to fall elsewhere from the Hawaii target area. U.S. engineers narrowed its re-entry to somewhere in Scandinavia, but the capsule was never found. So what happened to the capsule? It turns out that some loggers stumbled across it in the winter of 1968 or 1961. It was found near Kalinin, 200 kilometers north of Moscow. The loggers who found it cracked it open with an axe. What was left was examined by Soviet engineers, but didn't reveal much information. It was just a polished aluminum sphere, 30 centimeters in diameter, and gilded on the exterior. The joke was on the Soviets. The capsule was in fact an inert prototype meant to test capsule recovery techniques. April 14, 1912. David Sarnoff picked up a message of distress call of the Titanic relayed from ships at sea on this date that said, quote, SS Titanic ran into iceberg, sinking fast. The 21-year-old telegraph operator was using a powerful Marconi radio telegraph station on top of Wanamaker's department store in New York City. After receiving the initial message, he stayed at his post for 72 hours, receiving and transmitting the first authentic information on the disaster. He relayed the names of the rescued from the RMS Carpathia telegraph operator to newsmen and frantic family members. It turns out this was not to be Sarnoff's 15 minutes of fame. He went on to become a key pioneer in radio and television broadcasting. He founded the U.S. media network NBC in 1926, created an experimental television station for NBC in 1928, and subsequently became president and chairman of NBC parent Radio Corporation of America. He directed RCA and NBC until a year before his death in 1971. General Electric bought RCA in 1985 and broke it up, retaining only NBC, which was later sold to Comcast in 2011. April 15, 1966, Manned Spacecraft Center Director Robert Gilruth predicted on this date to the NASA Associate Administrator for Manned Spaceflight George Mueller that the agency needed a goal beyond those connected to the Apollo Lunar Program. He suggested a Mars flyby or landing as a worthy goal. Mueller was singularly unimpressed, as he had been fending off Werner von Braun for years on the very same topic and was more focused on the near-term objectives of the agency. Mueller would later feud over the same issue with NASA Administrator Thomas Paine, who had succeeded James Webb in 1968. Mueller was more in favor of focusing on the Apollo program and the Space Shuttle, which was the first leg of the Space Transportation System plan. 
This was what exactly transpired. The Mars manned exploration objectives, the nuclear and conventional spacecraft plans, and the future space stations were all scrapped, and the space shuttle became the only significant NASA program to follow Apollo. Ironically, Mueller was no more successful in spite of his maneuvering than Gilruth and Payne, and exited NASA along with the other two by the end of the Apollo program in 1973. It turned out that Gilruth was right. NASA was tied to the expensive and bloated space shuttle for the next 40 years and achieved little else in manned space development. The agency also never returned to the moon after the last Apollo mission in 1972. Gilruth's ideas have only returned to the forefront with the advent of Elon Musk's SpaceX, who is developing the Starship Interplanetary Spacecraft and is planning for an initial Mars base by 2026. April 16, 1972, Apollo 16 was lifted to its lunar trajectory by a Saturn V rocket from the Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39A on this date. The crew was Duke, Mattingly, and Young. The payload featured Command Module CSM-113 and Lunar Lander LM-11. The mission arrived in lunar orbit on April 19th, and the lander alighted on the moon's surface a day later. Young and Duke drove 16 total miles across the lunar surface in three trips and collected samples. The lander returned to the command module on April 23rd, and the crew returned to Earth and splashed down in the Pacific on April 27th. The mission was an unqualified success, but the story ended on an unusual note. The aircraft carrier USS Ticonderoga had delivered the Apollo 16 command module to the North Island Naval Air Station near San Diego on May 5th. Three days later, ground service equipment being used to empty the residual fuel in the command module tanks exploded in a hangar. 46 people were sent to the hospital, most suffering from inhalation of toxic fumes, with one technician suffering a fractured kneecap from falling equipment. A hole was blown in the hangar roof 250 feet above, and about 40 windows in the hangar were shattered. CSM-113, which only suffered a 3-inch gash in one panel during the accident, eventually went on display at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama. April 17, 1964, Geraldine Mock landed in Columbus, Ohio in this state, becoming the first woman to complete a solo airplane flight around the world. She was a Columbus homemaker with less than 800 hours logged and seven and a half years of flying experience and had received her instrument rating less than a month before taking off from Columbus on March 19th in 1964 in a single-engine Cessna Model 180 aircraft on her 23,000-mile solo air voyage. The trip lasted 29 and a half days with 21 stopovers. Mock later published a book about the flight in 1970 called 3-8 Charlie. She died in 2014, age 89. An almost forgotten part of this flight is the media frenzy due to the fact another woman, Joan Smith, was attempting the same feat at the same time from an airfield in San Francisco, California on March 17, 1964. Smith's departure date and flight path was the same as the aviator Amelia Earhart's last flight. However, despite Smith's two-day head start, Mock returned first. Smith died tragically only a year later in a plane crash, along with writer and fellow aviator Trixie Schubert. Smith was 28. April 18, 1925. The first U.S. commercial transcontinental radio transmission of a facsimile, better known as a fax, was sent from San Francisco to New York City on this date. The faxed photograph showed actress Marianne Davies receiving a makeup box as a gift from Louis B. Meyer of MGM Pictures. The service had been tried out the previous month by the American Telephone and Telegraph Company on March 4, 1925. Those test faxes showed images of the inauguration of President Calvin Coolidge in Washington, D.C. Nine photographs were transmitted in total, each taking seven minutes, going to New York, Chicago, and San Francisco. Faxes are still in use in 2021, despite the ubiquity of broadband internet connections, due to the perception that faxes are more secure. Faxes are sent via telephone lines instead of via packets through internet servers. Although, many telephone systems are now voice over IP and may in fact rely on a portion of the internet backbone. April 
Before we get to the current event of the week, we wanted to see if you enjoyed this 44th episode of Bladed Tech's The Space and Tech History Rewind. If so, click that like button. Did you agree with our choices, or are there other events that were better? Go ahead and share with us by dropping a comment below. And if you have suggestions for an event in the future, we'll take those too. We'll credit events we pick for future videos to those viewers that post them. We hope you have been enjoying our content. Have we earned your subscription to our channel? If yes, and you have not yet taken the opportunity as of yet to subscribe, please take a moment to do so now and click the bell notification icon so you don't miss upcoming videos. We want to continue delivering great content to you. You can always unsubscribe and subscribing is free. On April 3rd, 2021, Amazon admitted to U.S. House of Representatives member Mark Pokin that their drivers are in fact forced to urinate into plastic bottles during the working hours. Pokin had previously tweeted, quote, paying workers $15 an hour doesn't make you a progressive workplace when you union bust and make workers urinate in water bottles. Amazon had tweeted in return, quote, if that were true, nobody would work for us. The company was forced to backtrack after evidence emerged of drivers having to urinate in bottles. We owe an apology to Representative Pokin, Amazon said in a prepared statement. The tweet was incorrect. It did not contemplate our large driver population and instead wrongly focused only on our fulfillment centers. Links to some of our most recent episodes can be found in the description section below. You can peruse our entire 250 plus video library by looking at our playlists, which conveniently sort videos by subject. We announce all new videos on our microblogging accounts, as well as in the community feed for this channel. Want to know how to navigate our channel content? We refer to RetroTech and Innovation Documentary segments as episodes. Coverage of current events in space exploration, science, and technology are labeled as shorts. Space and tech history are documented in an anthology called Milestones. And gameplay recordings can be discovered on the Bladed Tech Gaming Channel in videos called Walkthroughs and Side Missions. Stay connected by occasionally checking our Instagram feed, where we post content from our upcoming episodes and from episodes past that you may have missed. And finally, join us on our Facebook and Minds pages, where we cover current news and events related to channel content. Thanks for watching, 